Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, joining us today. She's an Olympic champion. She's an NCAA champion. She's an ISL champion. Most recently, she is the world record holder and breaker in the 100 short course meters butterfly today. We get to sit down with Kelsey Dahlia. What's up? Thanks. Thanks. It sounds like a still getting used to that introduction, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> start there that we I talked to you briefly after the uh the ISL final um but let's break it down a little more first race of that final especially coming off of the playoffs where I don't know when you got when did you like the athletes find out that they were combining the playoffs with the final I think the teams that had a chance of making the final were told pretty much in Naples that that was pretty much going to be on the table that we would just stay in Eindhoven another week. And so I was happy with that decision. And I think most teams were just to stick around a few extra days and do it there. I mean, it's, it definitely seemed like the right decision f- from every standpoint, you know, logistically mm-hmm. for the, for the athletes, for the coaches, for everyone. Um, I thought, I don't know. I don't remember exactly when we found out, I was just a little surprised. It's like, Oh, this seems like, kind of last minute, but obviously behind the scenes, you, you knew what Mm -hmm. you were doing or you knew where you were heading into. Yeah. Um, I knew to pack for a full month. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Nice. Um, so, so then coming into the playoffs, what was the prep work like, um, after the ISL regular season, knowing that you had those three matches leading into the final? Mm -hmm. I did a really good job of training consistently and, I had adjusted my training since trials. I've been doing singles uh, since June. So I've been joking that I've been living the single life. And for people that don't know, I'm married. So it's a, I like to think it's a funny joke. And so I don't think that's funny because Tomah is one of my favorite people. (laughs) He's a great guy and has been (laughs) the most supportive of me this year and every year. But um, so I've been doing single practices and adjusting my training, working more with our sprint coach. And because of that, I've also been able to push it a little bit more in the weight room. And so I feel like I've really gained a lot of strength this fall and summer as well. And so that has allowed me to be sharper in practices. I'm not doing as much aerobic, which is not my favorite thing anyway. And so in general, I'm just a happier person <laughs> on pool deck and off. And so I use those weeks to be as consistent and, and to get a little sharper and my, my turns and my kickouts especially. And so, um, yeah, I didn't really try to taper too much going into the playoffs because I knew I wanted to have enough in the tank by the fourth week. So I was still lifting pretty heavy the week before and doing singles. I was like, I don't want to cut back too much more <laughs> because it's already a big, jump from nine or 10 practices a week to six. And so I wanted to have enough in the tank for the whole week to the whole four weeks to get sharper week after week. And so racing so much is training and it allows me to have so many quick races back to back to make those adjustments. Sorry. (coughs) And so I was able to make like, I love the numbers of my kick counts and stroke counts. And so being able to take that feedback from one week to another and make those adjustments is fun for me. Yeah. Uh, so first off during that time period, do you take a day off ever? And, and if so, when is that day off knowing that you have two days of racing um, mm-hmm. every week? Mm-hmm. The longest we had between matches was seven days without racing and otherwise it was five or four days. I did take the day off after a match. I think I took two or three days off the whole time. I didn't take one every week and just for mental health purposes. And it's surprisingly so draining. It's just two days of racing for two hours, but I was 
a zombie. And most people were the day after just, I would sleep in and it's also hard to wind down after the match mentally. And so to totally shut down and then, uh, so yeah, just letting my body sleep till when it needed to. And which was kind of easy with the gloomy weather we had over there, <laughs> but yeah, I would still take some, some days off. Let's, let's dive a little deeper into that. Cause I feel like most people probably don't realize how much goes into a race day and then to have to back that up with second race day. Um, because you say it's, it's mentally exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting. Obviously it's physically exhausting, but you, when you wake up on a race day, you know, are, is your mind kind of already switched? Like, do you already have to be turned on basically when you wake up or if not, when does that start for you? And then what does the process look like leading up to the actual two hour meet? Mm. I try not to let my body be on that early. I still take a little bit of a nap and after then, then um, my body's a little jittery and my adrenaline starts to go. So I try to keep my adrenaline down until we get to the pool. And, but I like to do a wake up swim and thankfully because our matches were so late, our wake up swims would be like nine or 10 AM, which is really nice. (laughs) And I actually have a really good gauge of how I'm going to swim based on how I feel in the water that morning. When I went 54 on the second playoff match, I was feeling, I could feel the water so well and like on my feet, on my hands. And I was trying not to get too out of myself because I don't like to put too much weight into how I feel. Cause if I don't feel good, then I don't want my mind to just like discount a good swim. So, but I was like, Ooh, I'm going to, I'm going to use this and let this carry me. And then same on the last day when more and more so in the afternoon warm up, I felt like I was floating on top of the water. I was like, it, it was a really rare moment that I felt that good. So uh, I try to collect myself and not use that adrenaline until we get to the pool. And then our team's just hanging out until it's time to warm up and ready to go. And what is so nice is, you know, it's just going to be two hours, you know, in age group meets, you have, <laughs> have no idea how long it can be. My little sister is 12 and she just had a me into the 500. And those are like six plus minute long 500s and who knows how many heats. And so I'm like really grateful that we can at least count that. We know it's two hours that we need to be on whether racing or supporting teammates or cheering for the team. And, um, but it is still so draining. I would talk to like, I remember talking to Beta or, or Lily at just how, how did we swim so many races at the NCAA championships? <laughs> and it's like seven sessions and have to be a hundred percent each race. And so I, I wouldn't want to have to go back and do that again. <laughs> I guess that's why the NCAA <laughs> happens when you're 18 to 22. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, because when you put it like that under these circumstances, like, Oh my God, that does sound mm-hmm. awful. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, uh, I totally <laughs> relate as a non-athlete to what you're talking about. Like I'll watch an NBA game sometimes, like a basketball game sometimes, uh, at, you know, kind of late night and it'll end at like 10 or 11. And like, I won't be able to sleep for two hours just cause like, I'm so <laughs> like fired up mm-hmm. on adrenaline just from watching. So like, uh, I can't even imagine what it's like <laughs> after competing and putting mm-hmm. your body through all that. Um, so that's, so it's like, yeah, it's, it's like a whole day thing. And then you have to do it again. And then you finally get your day off of, of, of rest, uh, mm-hmm. which seems really nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Much needed for sure. Um, okay. So then it's heading into the final, like you said, you felt, you, you felt pretty good. You had kind of planned your taper around that. Um, was the world record on your mind, especially after having gone that 54 in the second playoff match? I'd be lying if I said it wasn't on my mind. I knew it was there and I knew that I could still make some adjustments, stayed out of the weight room a little bit before the final and just floated a little bit more that last week. And so I, it was on my mind, but I was trying to keep the time out of my mind because anytime I shoot for a time, it, it doesn't happen. I'm focused on that rather than staying relaxed or the, my technique. And so I don't even think I knew what the 
exact time was. I just heard the announcer say that I set the world record. I saw it on the screen. So I had no idea really how much exactly I had broken it by. Um, but it was really, really cool to see, see that. And then also to have some against Sarah, just a couple lanes over and she was the former record holder. So to have competed all these years together, I'm sure she wasn't too thrilled, but <laughs> it's still um, a, a special to get to be next to her to do that. No kidding. I mean, I, and again, I think that that's just one of the cool things about ISL. We, we covered how, uh, how Sarah had encouraged Siobhan Howie to, to break her world record in the 200 free, which she hasn't quite nabbed yet, but it seems, seems like it's coming one day. And then, mm. you know, again, yeah, like you said, to, to be able to compete against Sarah and, and break her world record in the same race, it's pretty unique. Uh, mm-hmm. pretty, you know, n- not something you, you get everywhere, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we, we covered the ISL final, um, obviously the Condors a close second. Um, I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, you know, a lot of like team USA meets or international meets, you're, you're a little more focused on yourself unless it's like relays. Um, it, as I'm su- sure certainly as a professional, you're a little more just focused on your career and what you're doing. So to, to be in an environment where the team matters a lot more, um, especially when you're competing for a title, which I don't think that was the mindset necessarily when you were competing for Louisville. Um, what was that like for you? And uh, again, compared to the rest of your pro career, when maybe mm-hmm. you weren't as focused on a team, you're more focused on your performances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a lot there. And even compared to college, you don't have, uh, unless you're like the top one or two teams, you don't have 15 girls and you're not with the guys either. So that's unique as well, getting to fight men and women. And also you don't have someone in each event. And so every single heat, this, the points are swinging and it's just a roller coaster every event. And so that's really unique as well and, and adds a, another level of excitement. But there's definitely an extra level of caring, I think, that we have for each other. Like we, sicknesses were going around. And so as soon as someone would say like they weren't feeling well, a few of us would come together like, okay, well, I, can I give you some, some of this, like, how can I help? Like, just make sure you're resting, like prioritize. Like we, our coaches did a really good job of looking at it as a whole and the focus was on the final. And so whether that was saving emotional energy or physical energy on the earlier matches, because we had the bigger picture in mind and I am super proud of our team. We showed up when it mattered the most and so many highlights in the final, but there's definitely a lot different level of caring and willingness to sacrifice there's there were people that were had to be relay only swimmers or maybe didn't get to swim their their best event because other people were um, selected to for those races but there was a level of okay uh, that's that's for this is for the team and I'm willing to be a cheerleader for that race and so if there was a lot of complaining I I didn't see it people did a good job of of keeping their disappointment to themselves and being in the box to, to cheer for their team, for the team. And, and I think that we came together really well. We didn't have as many Americans as we have had in the past. And that comes with people who haven't swam collegiately and know the, the team priorities that we create in NCAA and everyone really bought in. And I think all, all the, some of the new people were also really nervous to be a part of the, the champion reigning champions and everyone uh, meshed together really well. And I could see some of the new people's confidence just grow so much as we got to know each other as people and swimmers. And uh, so many people were going best times and national records every match and just really proud of every person on the team. Well, it, it was a great match to watch, as I've said many times. <laughs> Congratulations to the Condors for, for a great season overall. Um, and so you talked about it earlier. You've been living the single life. There's a lot to unpack here. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's start with um, go, going back a bit, heading into Olympic trials this summer. Um, what was your training like 
just heading into that meet a few months before and how are you feeling about Mm -hmm. where you were at in training and also where you would be at Olympic trials? Mm -hmm. I was super consistent in my training the last two year and a half, I guess, if we talk about like since COVID, Mm -hmm. I was really consistent. I bought a weight room for my garage and had that little pool in my backyard. And I really never missed a weight session. And I found really creative ways to stay in shape. So I was really proud of my consistency there, but I think emotionally it just took a toll. And if I really admit, and and I'm honest, I was showing up at practice, but it wasn't to get better every day. And I didn't have that extra drive and extra, you know, something that you can't find at the start. It has to come from within you. And so I was going through the motions a lot of the time and that was, it it was a really, really challenging year. And even I got a text from Zach Harding after the, the world record last week. And he said, Hey, I'm just really proud of you. I saw how hard it was beginning of the year. And and in 2020. And so to come from there, he said, he's really proud. And I agreed. It wasn't always easy the last year and a half and no one had it easy. Uh, But so going into uh, Olympic trials, I definitely had some, some doubts, I think inside, I was a lot more nervous than I was, especially in 2016 being the underdog there. And then being someone who was chased this time was completely different. And I was trying to have as fake that fun. I, I swim best when I'm relaxed and having fun. And that was my first race at Olympic trials and the, the prelims. I was just ready to go. And then I think I, I let just the pressure of it sneak in. I know I let the pressure of it come in. And uh, even beforehand talking to Arthur, just, I knew the worst case scenario for me was not making a team and going to Jamaica with my husband. So there was no bad option. <laughs> and so I was just trying to remind myself that no matter the result, like my family still loves me, nothing really changes. And, um, but I didn't have what it it took in the final, but really I was still so proud. All all of my swims were some of the best I'd had in a few years. And I still watched the Olympics. I had so many friends there and I was thinking, well, I'm a swim fan. I'm not going to watch who was going to watch. So I, I wanted to cheer for my friends as well and follow along. And it was exhausting as a fan because of the time difference. So I was ready for it to done, be done just because I wanted to sleep in a little bit more. But, um, and I, I honestly, seeing how fast the hundred fly was made me feel better because I thought even if all the stars aligned, I wasn't going to go 55 whatever it was to make a, a medal. So um, it did make me feel better. And I, I'm proud of Tori and Claire and exciting to see how their futures are in the sport, how they continue to improve and how they do next week too. Uh, well, amen to the Olympics <laughs> being over because that time difference was brutal. It's exhausting. <laughs> it was, it was not my favorite need to cover. Um, <laughs> so I hear you there. Uh, <laughs> so you mentioned that at trials, you had some of the best swims you'd had in the last few years. Um, and you know, you, it's like you would, you would weigh the options of like, okay, well, worst case scenario, I get to go on vacation. Right. And like my family's still going to love me and like my friends are still going to be there. Um, but when you missed the, when you missed the team in the hundred fly, how, did it take some time for that to re-sink in and for you to like kind of realize that again? Oh yeah. It it's still disappointing like to be beat. <laughs> I can't say I was like I'm I'm I knew they were the best people for the country, but I wasn't like thrilled to not make the team. But there was definitely some relief there. Um, but then also just like embarrassment, you know, so many different emotions that went through and um, so I'm like FOMO of not be, being able to be there with my, my friends and getting to see the, the new culture of the team, just the other small memories. Um, so yeah, there's definitely so many that probably like all the five stages of grief, you know, <laughs> that I really went through. Mm-hmm. How long do you feel like it took you to 
to to get through that. I mean, because you like you said, it's the first event of the meet. You still had other swims. Did you swim 150 free? I did. Mm-hmm. You swim, you didn't swim to your fly, did you? No. <laughs> Hold Arthur, I've retired from that, but I <laughs> stopped doing an ISL. But it's a little easier, of course. <laughs> right. Um, so it's so yeah, it's like how do you deal with you know, and on Cali, you talked about the goldfish mentality, but mm-hmm. like at trials, it's <sighs> It's it's hard to put things behind you. So it's like how how do you reckon with dealing with the grief of missing the team in, in your prime mm-hmm. event and have still having other events to swim? Mm-hmm. The silver lining I try to focus on that it was they were some of my best hundred flies I'd had. So I I knew that my body was still in 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 good shape. And so I tried to focus on that. And it's still thankfully there was still a couple of days between hunter fly and hunter free. So I had a couple days to reshift my focus and my mind. So that way I could still attempt to <laughs> attempt another event. And I had been on the 400 free relay in 2017, 18, 19. And so I tried to channel some of those swims, but my freestyle has been off for the last couple of years. So I didn't quite have that in me, but still to the semifinal in both of those events was something I'm really, really proud of. Dude. Top, yeah. Top 16, not, not, not anything to shake your head at for sure. Um, and then, and then, like you said, you go on vacation. Um, and then, and then what, you know, like what, what came up for you between, I, I'm guessing, you knew you had, had, had ISL, but that was, two months away at that point. Um, Mm -hmm. so what did, what did those two months look like for you? Mm -hmm. So I did go to the Dominican for a few days with a ministry from my church and got to talk to some of those teams, which at the moment of the hunter fly, I thought that was something I would never want to do again, but God really healed my heart. And I was able to share with them that even though I didn't make the team, like the last five years weren't a waste. And um, so I got to go there and see the ways that the ministry is involved in the Dominican down there and hopefully can go keep going back because there's such a need for learn to swim there. And then just tried to live life in, in Louisville. I helped out in nursery at my church and got to just spend time with friends and celebrated my birthday with my community here. And, but in the back of my mind, <clears throat> uh, I don't know at what point this was, but I think even before trials or after, I don't know, before trials, Jason Lezak, I think texted our whole team and said, Hey, no matter what happens this summer, will you be ready to go for ISL? And I said, yes. And I, I meant it. I wanted to be true to my word. And so that was always in the back of my head. Like I told Jason Lezak, I would be in shape for ISL. And so that was what kept me motivated to get back in the water. And I really think I only took four days out of the water, three or four days, and then swim uh, outside with my husband. And that was really therapeutic. I wasn't getting my times. I wasn't having like goals in practice those first couple of weeks, but just to keep the feel of the water and soak up the sun was really, really healthy for me at the time. So I never lost the feel of the water, which also is something that kept me motivated because I hate that first few days when you feel like spaghetti. Mm -hmm. and going yeah starting from zero so that kept me motivated and just finding enjoyment and lifting again Uh, after trials we were allowed back in our uh, college weight room and so that was so enjoyable again because our weight room is really nice and uh, getting to work with our strength coach again so having fun goals in the weight room to see how much strength I could build and hitting new maxes and different lifts, um, was, was another fun goal to have. So I was, I didn't miss too much time out of the water, but I didn't put too much pressure on it as well. I gave myself a lot of grace and tried some new things. And there were, there was a day actually on my birthday, I was for the very first time in Louisville at practice. And there was like seven of us there. And no one remember my birthday except my brother, like halfway through practice. And I was like, even my brother doesn't remember. And it was 6 a.m. So I understand that <laughs> people aren't thinking about birthdays that early. But I was like, this is really sad because I 
thought I'd be in Hawaii right now, but I tried not to dwell on that too long. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> well, I'm glad he eventually remembered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so then when did, he, you know, you get back in the weight room, you keep the feel of the water. You're like, I have to be ready for Jason Lezak and the Cali Condors. <laughs> um, but when did, when did that shift in training really start for you of, of doing singles instead of doubling of working with the sprint coach who does, who is the sprint coach at Louisville? Oh, Chris Lindauer. Okay. Chris or Chris. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. When did, when did that start? It kind of just happened in the middle of the summer because I thought I was just going to single for a few weeks and then I, I never wanted to double. So <laughs> I just was going to make it work with singling and my, my fitness level stayed really high. And even there was one day this fall where I ended up having to do a long course aerobic practice and it was still like 5k. And I was like, Ooh, I don't know how this is going to go. And am I going to just hit the wall? But I did the whole thing and I did really, really well. And I was like, Oh, I still got it. So my, uh, Chris was just saying like, we don't need to make the aerobic like shelves bigger. We just need to keep just stacking what we have. And so that was just transitioning to a more power focus in the water as well. So I still did um, a little bit of aerobic, but then more 50 and hundred pace stuff. And our VO two set every week went from about 1200 to 300. So I do six fifties on two minutes. I love that. (laughs) And it was nauseating. Every week would be really nauseating. Zach joined the last week and he was throwing up at the end. So uh, (laughs) it's deceivingly really challenging. And so I was really consistent in those. And I think that really carried into my skins. And I was also just really pumped to do skins for the first time. I never did them before. And so a year ago, yeah, this was the first year we ever did butterfly skins. But if I had last year, I don't think I would have made it past the first round. I was not very sharp last year in the 50. And even I think my hundred in the final last year would have been one of my slowest this year. So I was just, this (laughs) the training, training has been working. (laughs) (laughs) No kidding. Um, What? So it's the, your VO two set is just six fifties on two minutes that's mm-hmm. it. Just go, go as fast as you can. Yeah. So the, the expectation is raised a lot <clears throat> and I would do three fly three free okay. and it, yeah, it really, it really gets you. <laughs> uh, so you say the expectation is raised. So what is that? Like what, what were you holding or, or yeah. Mm-hmm. What, what were you holding on those or what was the goal? Yeah. So I would hold 24 mids fly and 23 mids free. This is yards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then no, like cool down, warm down, moving around in between. No, we just got to wait on the wall. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, And this is just Andre Barna and Zach and I. So it wasn't the whole team joining mm -hmm. on us. We would got to do this, um, the three of us, but definitely a a much different stimulus. (laughs) Interesting. So in your time at Louisville, have you always had the same coach? Was, was, was Arthur, is Arthur, was Arthur your primary coach? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I worked with him for nine years and, uh, and he's still my coach, but, right. um, there was one year, probably my sophomore year, I tried more of a sprint centered training and mm-hmm. it didn't work for me at the time. And so he's had that in his head all these years. <laughs> I'm like, that was when I was 19. (laughs) I think it's time to try something else. And for the ISL season, it, it was definitely a good time to try it. You know, we're not doing prelims. I'm not focusing on the 200 fly as much, but it was a a really great time to try it because short course, you can afford to be work on the power a little bit more. And so, uh, and for my mental health, I needed to switch it up as well. There's times last year we would do like 12, 200s best average. And I would look at Arthur and say, this set makes me want to quit swimming. (laughs) I just never, those are some really low rough moments. And so I just really needed to to switch it up. And this was the perfect time to, to try that. 
Yeah. And I also just, I think as, as an older woman in the sport, we don't have so much data on what our bodies need. And so I've trying, been trying to advocate that I need less and I try not to look back and think what if, but I think I was a little bit suppressed still going into trials and who knows what I, what I needed, but, um, I did what I did my best for where I was at there. Yeah. So, so now moving forward, do you think you'll stick with this training program? I think for a little bit, I might need to throw one or two doubles a week. Um, but I don't want to do like those crazy aerobic long course practices again. So, uh, I haven't really had a good long discussion debrief with the, the coaching staff since I've been back, but that is definitely on the table. Things are crazy. So it might be after Christmas and new year's, but, um, yeah, I just need to debrief and brainstorm what the future looks like. Nice. Well, that, that certainly sounds exciting. It's, I, I think we've seen more and more athletes older and younger kind of, kind of shift towards this, especially if the focus is on racing and in like in an ISL format or, or mm-hmm. maybe in a NCAA or short course format, but it's, it's cool to hear about just, just because it allows for change in our sport and it allows for lots of different ideas and mm-hmm. on, on, on how to be the best swimmers we can be. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Kelsey, I, I appreciate you taking the time to chat and, uh, it's been great catching up with you. Do you have, do we miss anything? Do you have any parting thoughts before we sign off? Not on the top of my head. I am excited. We didn't really talk about this and this has been covered, but excited to see how short course worlds goes and hopefully maybe the selection process can be changed after uh, we didn't have ISL before um, any other uh, short course worlds. So I hope that this encourages the, the national team selection process to, to maybe shift in the future. Agreed. (laughs) I think that would be nice too. I think, I think, yeah, I think most people have made their feelings on that one pretty clear. I think, like you said, we didn't have ISL before. We didn't have a lot of short course meters data. Now we do. And it seems like, uh, yeah, it seems like the selection process should catch up on that one. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have anything, do you have any races you're particularly excited to watch in, uh, Abu Dhabi? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm excited to watch all the flies and the relays. Just excited to see. How, they might have to get a little creative with some of the relays. So I'm excited to see <laughs> who gets how those are formed and just how it goes. And um, I've never been over there, so I don't know. Yeah, just want to hear what what the setup is like and and all that. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. I re- I remember perusing the roster and being like. I don't know what these relays are going to look like. <laughs> I guess uh, I guess some some people will get the chance to step up and, and show mm-hmm. us what they got. Mm-hmm. We need to teach some relay starts. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, ample relay exchange yeah. practices. Yeah. Seriously. Um, <laughs> well, again, Kelsey, it's always great chatting with you, and, and thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Coleman. Good to talk with you. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.